Thank you all for coming. This is very humbling. There are a ton of you in here. Um, hold on. This is real good. Real good timing. Uh, let me hit this can of water. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, so thank you for coming out. Um, thanks to Kim for having me and setting this whole thing up. Um, I'm just going to show you some work. It's going to be pretty informal. So if anybody in the middle of this wants to interrupt with anything, please do. Um, I know there's a Q&A at the end, but if there's something that you have a question about as it's going through, feel free. Okay. All right, we already got that. So, like I said, um, or like Kim said, I'm a screen printer uh, and an illustrator here in Chicago, and I've been doing it for about 10 years now, or I guess a little over 10 years now. and. Uh, I've been doing it full-time for three years. Uh, before that, I was doing it full-time while also working full-time at a publishing company here. So it's, I'm sort of new to doing it myself, but it's been three years now, so, so far so good. Um, this theme today, oh, this is the wrong way. <laughs> there we go. Today's theme is weird. I should get my notes here. I thought there was gonna be a podium. Uh, so, <laughs> so today's theme is weird, and uh, that's, that's me and my little sister, Rachel, who's also an artist, and you should follow her work uh, if you don't already. Um, she goes by Rad Illustrates, and she does really funny topical illustrations pretty much every day. Uh, but yeah, so as you can see, we are totally not weird at all. Um, I grew up in northern Illinois in a really small town called Johnsburg. Um, if you listen to Tom Waits, he wrote a song about it. That's the only thing that ever happened in Johnsburg. He's, <laughs> Tom Waits' wife was from there. Uh, so I grew up there, and uh, art was always a pretty big thing in our family. Uh, my dad always drew, um, I don't know, it was like something that both my sister and I took to very early on. We like, really liked drawing. So it was, we would always be drawing, and we would make games, we like, mar both of us with our dad would make board games together sometimes on just a sheet of cardboard, and then you'd play the game and see if it was good or not. And if, if it didn't make any sense, we'd throw it away. But if it was good, we'd put it under the couch, and then we'd play it again next time. <laughs> so early on, we were doing all kinds of weird stuff like that. And uh, I don't know, I think, I think it really shaped things. And the both of us, well, I should show, OK. So <laughs> I found some old comics that I made. It's really funny that I drew comics because I don't think I ever really read comics, and I still don't, but I, I found all these comics from when I was like 10 years old, and I scanned some of them because they're so ridiculous. And th this was called Silence of the Ninja, which is a very <laughs> ominous tone. <laughs> very strange, but... <laughs> so I, I made a bunch of these, and I made them like incessantly. There's like stacks of these things. And they don't, nothing really happens in them as, you know, as a 10 year old really doesn't understand the arc of a plot or how to keep a story going. But I made these things like, like I needed to for some reason. I just kept making these things. And uh, my dad at the time, well, my dad was a roofer. So at the time he was also working, delivering newspapers in the morning uh, because during the winter roofing slows down a lot. So he would deliver papers and there, there was a guy at the newspaper who helped he, my dad would take these to him and he would scan them because I was drawing them on a weird sized sheet of paper so I couldn't make photocopies of them. And instead of just changing the shape that I drew them to, my dad would take them to the newspaper and have them scan it on a large scanner and then print them out at eight and a half by 11. <laughs> but these are, so these are these ridiculous comics. And the funniest thing about these to me still is that I remember uh, in middle school in like fourth or fifth grade, we had like a show and tell where you'd bring something that you made, I think. And I brought a bunch of these to show. And I still remember there was a kid in the class who was a total jerk. 
and he <laughs> he would not believe me that I made them. He would not take. He was like. He, d he would not let up, and he kept being like, no way, like, somebody, like uh, you bought those, or like, your dad drew those. So when I see these now, I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> it's really funny that he was just could not, that might have, maybe that was the first time I realized I could draw better than the other people in my class, but it's hilarious to me that he thought, like, my dad drew these for me because they're so bad. <laughs> But then there were, there's some other ones, like this was, <laughs> cops. <laughs> this was like something about, I think it was called Ninja Crow. So, and then the, the bad guy's a cardinal. But I have like this weird, yeah, I was moving into color in this at least. And then there's <laughs> the second panel. There he is on the Sears Tower with the USA shooting at it. <laughs> he is domed to be continued. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And then this was one about trolls, which is hilarious. I, I didn't even remember doing these, but my sister was really into treasure trolls. She had a lot of phases where she would collect a certain thing, and at this point it was treasure trolls. So for some reason I felt the need to make this comic about it. And uh, so this is just them, they're getting on their plane, it's time for their vacation. And then there's this frame with this really, <laughs> these really tiny trolls in the chairs and this guy who's also on this flight who's very confused about what's going on. <laughs> That's probably my finest work to date. So, uh, yeah, so all through childhood I was like really into drawing and, I don't know, <laughs> the solitary arts. So I also, and this, it, like, in childhood too is where I sort of discovered skateboarding, and I think this is a very common theme among artists or people who do things that are similar to what I do. Because uh, skateboarding sort of affords you this weird look at art. It, it's, it's sort of, because there's a whole world of art hidden in that, and then there's also this attitude that's kind of like a total fuck you to everything. So it's really cool to discover that as a teenager in a weird small town and have this weird world that you can see into from magazines that's full of all this crazy art and music. And I, I don't know, I think like art and music, but finding those things through skateboarding is a very common thing. I don't think it's, I'm not very like unique in that way, but it's something that formed a lot of what was going on with me and still is. But that was a really cool thing to, to latch on to. And then in high school, I learned how to screen print. Um, I, took, I had a graphics class, which is really cool, and I don't, I don't know how common it is for schools to have that anymore. Because I had fine art classes, and those were great, but we also had a graphics class where that was taught by this guy named Zim, who was out of his mind. <laughs> if you're watching this, Zim, thank you, but you were out of your mind. He referred, he, he, his name wasn't Zim, but we had to call him Zim. <laughs> but he, so, he taught screen printing, and we learned how to run a tiny offset press, and we also learned how to use uh, like outmoded camera technology. They had a giant dark room where you could crank the camera in and take a positive inside there, and it was really cool stuff. And I feel like the, that's like the the ugly arts, like the hands-on stuff, and I think that was really important. And I don't know how many people get to do that kind of stuff in high school, but it was really it's funny because it was there just so we could like work for the school. We would print like the t-shirts the for the basketball team and stuff, it's brilliant. But we, I don't know, I, I got a lot out of it and it sort of pushed me in one direction. Well, I, I didn't, I, all right, well, so I didn't go to college for screen printing or art at all, actually. I went to college for advertising copywriting, uh, which was actually a mistake <laughs> that I just stuck with. I, I thought I was going for advertising design and then I realized I had enrolled in the copywriting part of the advertising program. <laughs> And that the art and design department was where that was taught and not the marketing and advertising department. So I went for advertising copywriting, and I, but I learned design along the way, and I ended up working at the school paper um, and starting as a political cartoonist, which was like probably the best job I'll ever have. Um, so I had to draw two cartoons per week, and I was paid, and I had a desk. So it was great, but then... The second week, or the, the second year that I worked at the paper, I started actually doing the layout and learning quark bleh, and <laughs> <laughs> going through the programs that way. And I actually left college with like a resume of layout work, even though I went to school for copywriting. But by the end of college, I decided I didn't want to be a copywriter anyway. 
or really, I didn't want to work totally within the advertising world and like being on the periphery. So, so beyond that, um, I worked at pretty much in publishing companies. Right out of college, I worked at a publishing company that put out a magazine, or well, magazine is a strong word, but it's, it was like a newsprint free monthly called Conscious Choice, and it was for like it was like a hippie like yoga. <laughs> Yoga enthusiast magazine. Uh, so I got that right out of college and I was laying that out. And after that, I worked for a, a magazine called like, uh, Miami Agent, which was specifically for realtors in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> but over time, I got really good at InDesign. I don't know if we have any InDesign freaks in the house. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of my thing. And I ended up working in that weird little niche industry of publishing because flowing pages and page layouts are a really weird thing that a lot of designers don't focus on. Uh, so over the years I worked in a few different places doing that and I ended up at a place called Guerrero How that did like custom publishing and we did a lot of like construction and building magazines and stuff like that and that's where I worked all the way up until I quit my job three years ago uh, and it was a it was a fine place to work it, uh, but what happened was I just eventually had so much freelance that I was sort of faced with the decision of, am I gonna turn down drawing something for somebody to keep a job that I'm just kind of blowing boring stories about construction? So I think like if anybody, you know, so obviously everybody, a lot of people uh, have an end goal of being a freelancer and sort of figuring out your own thing. And I think a lot of people worry about what the point is, if they're, not, if they're gonna realize where the point is or if they should set a goal or whatever, but I think when it happens, it's obvious. I think it's a, it's an easy choice when it's when it's the right choice to quit and do your own thing. It shouldn't be a hard decision. It, so that was where I ended up. Um, <laughs> well, I wasn't sure what this room was going to look like. This is actually I was just going to like sort of gesture in front of this. So then <laughs> later on, when it's online, I can take a screen cap and I can put it on Facebook, and then all my friends from high school will think I gave a TED talk. That's all that is. Okay, posters. So, let's see if I've, how much of this I've missed from not looking at it, because I don't have a podium. Uh, yeah, so posters are what I am mostly known for, and I think posters are what opened a lot of doors uh, for me for doing illustration and probably for getting to freelance at all. Um, in 2006, I started making posters because I was in a band and my friends were in bands and they started asking me to draw posters for their shows and uh, eventually they started getting them screen printed by other people and that was when I kind of thought, well, I used to know how to do this in high school, I can figure it out. So I started by printing, I was printing in my apartment in like a total ramshackle, like I was exposing screens in the closet and then washing stuff out in the tub and I was printing on a drafting table in my dining room. And, it, and it, my setup barely got more legit than that for like eight years. So I started off doing this for just for friends and then posters would go up and people would see them or they would play with another band and then that band would want a poster for their show. And I was very lucky to have a lot of bands in Chicago that wanted to use me over and over again, and I got to do some cool work. And a lot of people just sort of let me do whatever I wanted, which was great. Um, so I got to experiment a lot early on, and I'm gonna go through some posters. Um, I, was trying to, I was actually trying to figure out how many posters I've done so far, but I don't know, because there was a website called gigposters.com that was sort of like this giant archive of posters, and it went down and disappeared this year. And that was the only way I knew how many of what I had done. Like I, I made a book uh, like a year and a half to two years ago and thank God I did that before that thing went down because otherwise I'd have no idea what year I made any of that early stuff because I didn't write the year on any of it. So I think I've done around 150 to 175 posters in 10 years. Um, and obviously that's a lot to go through. So I just have a handful to, to show. Um, so my, my thing pretty much with posters is that I draw them all by hand. Um, I started in the last couple years incorporating fonts here and there just because I'm getting lazy, but 
So I, it started off as necessity and then just sort of developed into my style because early on I didn't have access to a computer to print films or do anything like that. So early on I had to figure out a way to make the films without going to Kinko's and spending 40 bucks to sit on some <laughs> like greasy computer and output films. So I realized that I could just buy rolls of acetate and draw right on them with paint markers. So in that way, uh, my process is pretty unique. Uh, not a lot of screen printers do it that way. Most people draw, scan it in, play with it in Photoshop, make the saps, and then print. But I actually draw the poster to scale on paper, and then I'll just roll acetate over it and draw with paint markers. Or I'll paint, in the last few years, I've been using like a water-based sign painting enamel that I can just paint right onto it too, and then you get all the brush strokes and stuff. So. Uh, so these are some older ones, pretty early on. Um, I got to work with a lot of smaller bands. I still work with a lot of smaller bands because a, a lot of my contemporaries in the poster world, uh, like do what they do a lot of like fish posters or Dave Matthews band, like huge. But the Black Keys had a lot of posters done, and I never get those jobs. <laughs> like a lot of people I know will get those jobs four times a year, but I'll do fifteen jobs for a small band <laughs> like twice a year. So my whole thing has kind of been working small and a lot. <laughs> so, and my, my edition sizes are still pretty, pretty low. I don't, it's rare that I'll print anything over a hundred. Uh, and back in the day, I mean, some of these I would print 20 or 30 of them and probably get 10 that weren't screwed up. So it was a long arc of learning how to print again. So, these are some more, there's a treasure troll again, I guess. <laughs> sort of ex figured it out. Uh, but so these were, th this one on the left is actually a show that was at a space that I ran with some people uh, called People Projects, where we lived in a storefront and we had shows in the basement and I had an art gallery in the front that I curated. And we lived there for two years in windowless rooms uh, with rats coming out of our basement and pulling stuff off the top of our refrigerator. <laughs> so we, but it was cool because we got to do whatever we wanted and I got free reign of this weird gallery. So having that weird storefront exposure was really awesome because I could put whatever I wanted out there. And I, I at one point built a half pipe in it that just went wall to wall and took up the whole room. And people would just walk by and sort of, because Logan Square was, not very hip back then, we did not have coffee shops. <laughs> so people would just wander by and very confused because it would be mattress store, mattress store, half pipe, mattress store. <laughs> or at one point too, I built a full scale replica of a Porsche 911 out of cardboard and paper mache. So it just looked like a really bad car dealership. There's just this one <laughs> dumpy looking fake car in it. So did a lot of stuff like that. Um, but that was sort of in the middle, well, the beginning to middle of my poster trajectory. So here are two posters with Gumby. Uh, <laughs> Gumby's very popular. Every time I do a poster with Gumby on it, people real, like it a lot. And that's because Art Cloakey is a genius, or was a genius. Um, so this is just some examples of weird, like this one's an early one. And that was one where I, I that was probably one of the first times I painted onto film and got the weird streaks in it and stuff like that. Um, here are a bunch of animals doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Um, I think a, uh, something that I try to do in my posters and in my work in general, I guess, is I always try to build in some sort of a visual payoff. Um, I kind of like, I feel like there's no point unless you kind of figure something out as you're looking at it. And not everything has that, but there should be some element where, I, I guess I just like when people are rewarded for paying attention. Because you walk around and nobody pays attention to anything, and these are hanging up in record stores or you know coffee shops or bars or whatever, or the club itself. And I think if you stop and look at something, there should be a payoff. Like, And humor is obviously like my biggest crutch, but I also like to build little things in where it's like a story. Like that in the last one, like this, the Gumby and Pokey and the Mustang, in the desert, and if you like, actually stop to look at it, and it says this car is stolen. So you have this weird payoff of like, what is going on? And it's just this weird like snippet of a story that there really is no beginning or end to. 
Um, but yeah, I like to build a little bit of a weird payoff where if you look at it long enough, you are rewarded. Um, and so some of my art prints that I'll show you at the end have a little bit more of a literal view of that, I guess. Um, these are some more posters that I've done. Um, I got to do a poster for Henry Rollins a few years ago, which was pretty cool. Um, yeah, he's a man of few words. <laughs> he's also really, really short, and he has the, the limpest handshake I've ever received, <laughs> which was the most upsetting thing, I think, that has ever happened to me. Um, these are, yeah, these are kind of some examples of a payoff if you stare at it long enough, because the, the OC's one, there's like a dead head behind there sitting on a mushroom, and the, the Grim Reaper is walking up on him and poking him on the shoulder, so if you read it long enough, you figure out that there's this little weird arc of the story, and then the Maps Analysis poster, Maps Analysis was a band I did a lot of work for. They used me all, like, over and over and over again. I did a lot of album art for them. I did a lot of posters. So it was cool, because it's cool to get to work with one client over and over again that way, and I pr pretty much got to do whatever I wanted. So that's one sort of based on those old battle scene drawings done by Native Americans, and you have the two little <laughs> cavalry guys laying in the dirt. Um, these are some more, somewhat more recent posters. Uh, yeah, this one, the guys in the rowboat, and they can see the topless mermaid down there. Uh, the this one on the right was for a festival that the Empty Bottle has been putting on where they have an outdoor music festival in, in early March. So the idea is that it's going to be very cold. And the funny thing is the last two years, I think it's been really temperate, but the first year it was very cold. So I sort of just drew what I would think as a musician having to play outside on March 1st. <laughs> and there's the Empty Bottle again. Uh, so yeah, this is one for Windy City Soul Club. I'm sure some of you have been to that and drank entirely too much there. Uh, and then the Black Lips was one I got to do a couple years ago for Austin Psych Fest, and that was actually printed by some friends down in Austin. Most everything I do is printed by me, but in recent years, uh, a lot of the more uh, higher edition stuff has been printed by my wife, Elizabeth, who is a screen printer who's better at it than I am and runs a giant machine that can do it better. So that was one that was done by some friends. Uh, Piss jeans, I don't know if you, <laughs> I get a lot of looks at festivals when I'm selling posters, because a lot of middle-aged to older people walk up and they wonder what pissed jeans is or means. Uh, but it's a band from Philadelphia, and uh, yeah, I, all I had to do was take Mr. Softy and flip his eyes upside down and it made him terrifying. <laughs> That's the only change I made. Uh, and then for Michael Cronin, like, this was an example of making a poster, and I kind of felt like it was like a little too like tough guy with the like traditional tiger thing, so then I put the little Snoopy sort of looking at it like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get it, all right. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So there's many more posters online if you are curious about some more of that kind of stuff. Um, this is a, gonna just be some some work uh, that this kind of led me into. Um, just basically, I got to do some cool work for cool companies and stuff like that. And I, I don't think I would have gotten there if I hadn't just kept doing posters for 50 bucks for my friends and then eventually getting to a point where enough people had seen my stuff to where I could get asked to do weird stuff like that. So, so these two have like a pitchfork tie-in. The, the one on the left was for Vans, and that was a tote bag that they gave away, uh, <laughs> I can't even remember if it was last year or two years ago. But, so that was that was a cool thing to do. I mean, I like Vans, that was a good project. They, uh, I don't know, they wanted a Chicago-centric thing, clearly, hot dogs. But uh, then the Sub Pop shirt was like a specific shirt they did just for just available at Pitchfork, which is kind of fun. Um, the down for life <laughs> guy. Sort of just what I imagined a guy like walking away from a gas station in Nebraska in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've only gotten to do one beer label, which is frankly upsetting to me, but this was a small brewery in California and they, it's a pretty specific thing because they kind of just let, they pick an artist and let you do whatever you want and then that's the label for the beer. And I kept doing really safe things and the guy was like, no, I don't, like that's, 
to do whatever you want. And I'd be like, well, that is what I did. Then he kept, but he kept pushing me. <laughs> and, and then eventually I was like, oh, all right, you want, like, I feel like that happens to me a lot where I play it safe and the people are like, oh, no, no, go for it. And then I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go for it then. Because a, a triple, if you're not familiar with beer, is a very strong beer. So I figured a guy breaking a chair over another guy. <laughs> And he liked it, so that's what it was. <laughs> um, so I talked about skateboarding a little bit. Uh, in 2009, I started a skateboard company pretty much just so I could make art for skateboards. Um, it lasted about four years, and we put out a couple of videos, and we used a lot of bad words on our skateboards. But it was basically supposed to be this dumb company for grown men because <laughs> so many men never stop skateboarding but their bodies don't allow them to be good at it anymore so you just sort of become this like well the the man ams ruin is like a joke that a man am is a, a, a full grown amateur in skateboarding it's somebody who never turned pro but you just kept going for it so i it's basically like a lot of crass graphics that i got to do but i also got free skateboards for a few years so that was a fun one. I actually have some skateboards coming out, uh, finally, finally, for a real company next spring. Um, if any of you are familiar with Enjoy, uh, there's going to be a series based on some of my art prints next spring, so it paid off, finally. Um, this is some public stuff that I've done. This is a mural off of North Avenue, and this was uh, myself with a handful of other artists, um, Son and Zimmer, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, was a part of this, and some people from the Post family, and it was just kind of a collaborative effort. Um, you can kind of see which ones were mine, though. <laughs> but uh, we, yeah, we put this up and cut out the, the, there was like an extra layer of wood, so all you could sort of see was the edges of that make part. Um, this is a piece that I made specifically for the Blue Line California stop. If any of you lived off the California stop, a few years ago. It was up, I think, for four, four or five years, something like that. Um, and then they renovated the station and took it down, and they said they didn't have room for it, but now the station's open again and that wall is just empty. <laughs> so I'm not really sure. It's in my garage, so <laughs> if anybody has a use for this eight foot by four foot inspirational sign, let me know. Get it out of my garage. Uh, this is another outdoor piece that I did uh, down in Austin uh, on Frank, which is a hot dog restaurant. Um, they do like a rotating mural, so we spent a couple days, Elizabeth and I, painting this. And for scale, that's, that's us. That's the biggest one I've ever done. <laughs> um, OK, so these are some covers that I've done for mostly the reader. Um, New City had me do one cover. I don't know, is New City even still publishing? <laughs> is there anybody, they are, okay. Is there somebody from New City here? Okay, cool, because I'm gonna talk shit. <laughs> no, uh, no, they, they're, they, they, that was a fun project, but yeah, they didn't pay very well and it took a very long time to get there. Um, you can beep this out in the video. <laughs> but the reader has used me a lot for covers and uh, I'm always very appreciative of that because I, I enjoy the reader, I read it every week and uh, it's just like a great publication for what's going on in the city and for some actual journalism sometimes. So this was a year in review where they wanted me to do a pinball machine with some Chicago elements in it. Um, and then these two were from the last year and a half, two years. Uh, pretty, I don't know, straightforward stuff, but um, I, it's, it's nice to have direction, I guess, because a lot of times I kind of just get to do whatever I want, which is great, but it's also sometimes a little bit hard to start when you can do literally whatever you want. So it's nice when somebody has something for me to go off of. Like, editorial illustration is amazing, and I wish I did more of it, but as we all know, there's no money. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's cool to do these projects. These are a couple of older ones. These are the last two of these. Um, the Guardian Grandpa one was really old. Uh, it's such a weird one, but I kind of like it. And I remember getting an email from them, and I had just started my, my last design job, and I remember like leaving the building to take the call to, to like get the, the story that I was going to be illustrating, and it's just so funny that I was, it was like, oh my god, I'm going to do a cover for the reader. Like, this is insane. And I'd like, yeah, and then, then, I, would, and then I would learn. <laughs> but yeah, it's, 
the best of, that was a fun one too. Um, that guy on the bike, I was actually an illustration from a whole other thing that just never got used. I'm sure a lot of you have a reject file on your desktop. Um, it's so funny to me, sometimes I'll draw something for somebody that gets rejected and I'll use it six years later for something that's it's perfect for, but I'm gonna hold on to that stuff. Okay, these are just the last few uh, slides are about some of the art print series that I've done lately. Um, let, me, let me check this again, make sure I haven't left anything off. Uh, so when I quit my job, um, 2013, I was really worried that, that, as anybody would be, that the work wasn't gonna keep coming, um, that freelancing, I was gonna have a lot of downtime. So what I decided was I was going to do a print series starting the next year, 2014, and uh, I was gonna do a print every week. I was gonna make a screen print. So it was gonna be a really small edition. I only made 15 prints of that one print, but I made one every Friday, or I released it every Friday for a year, because I figured when I was slow, then there would be this other thing going on that people would hopefully be paying attention to. And it was great, it was a lot of work, because what I didn't realize is I more or less had to have the idea by Tuesday, the drawing by Wednesday, print it on Thursday, and then release it on Friday, so it ate up essentially almost my entire week. <laughs> so when, <laughs> when I was busy, it was insane, but it was good practice and I always kind of, as I, like those comics I showed you at the beginning, I have always had this weird urge that I need to keep making things, I, just for me, I guess. Um, but it's, I like to have an output and I like to, even when nobody's asking me to, to keep making stuff. So I did this series and uh, these are all 52 of them, I'm not gonna go through all 52, uh, but they varied from five or six colors to just one color, and those were the weeks that I was really busy. So having to fit this in, um, I guess, was like a, a good experience for scheduling, if nothing else, but also my idea that I was gonna get really slow and I was gonna have to depend on these things kind of never happened. So it's also taught me that the, like, the freelance work would keep coming and that I just sort of needed to trust that it was gonna keep coming. So it was a, it was a good experiment. We put out a little book of all 52, um, but I'll show you one of them, which is this one, which I think will probably speak to some of you, but this was one that I made where it was actually a functional sign and it came with a set of numbers of one through five and there was a little slit in there where it would hold it. <laughs> So I, these sold so well, and I shipped so many of these to ad agencies. <laughs> like, I shipped a lot of these to buildings that some of you work in. <laughs> so then, at the end of that series, I was sort of faced with whether or not I was going to do another series, and I was kind of like stuck in this mindset where I, I was used to having to come up with something, so I figured I'd do another series, but it would be less intense. So I just did one print a month. Um, which was far, far less hectic, but uh, they were way more involved prints, way more colorful, more painterly, and to go back one, they were all based on a print that I did in the series, which is this one, which was called Autumn on the Farm with Shitting Dog. So there's just a farm scene, and then there's a dog taking a shit, and people really liked that one. <laughs> And it was really fun to do because I used a lot of transparency to get more colors to come out. Uh, and it was a challenge and it was almost all painted instead of drawn. So I decided then that I would do <laughs> the 2015 treasury of shitting dogs, uh, which is, it was so funny to read like little online things because so many people on like the, the poster or art collector forums and stuff would be like, why would anybody buy this? <laughs> like, why would anyone want to have this on their wall? Which is a fair question. But this, is, this feeds into my whole thing of, of like having a, some sort of a payoff, uh, like 100%. This is that idea on steroids, because the whole thing is basically like some pic picturesque scene that if, if you're just walking down a hallway, you would just your brain would just say, that's a nice picture, and then the second or third time you'd, you might notice the dog. Because <laughs> I, really, I really like that sort of payoff. Uh, and, and so I do like Renegade Craft Fair and I do some other art fairs and things like that. So I'll have 
of flip rack, and a lot of these are gone now, but when I had all of them, there was a rack of all of the ones that I had done, and just watching people walk up and go through it, and then sort of slowly figure it, like, <laughs> and then go back and like, because they'd be like, oh, these are really nice. And then they figure out that there's a dog taking a shit in every one of them. <laughs> but yeah, the whole idea is basically that I, it would be a very pretty picture that was essentially ruined. Like if you were taking a photo of a really pretty picture and then this dog was in it. <laughs> so this was the first one, which is based on like a 1950s Chicago photograph um, that I found and I sort of based a lot of these on old photos, postcards, and paint by numbers. So that sort of fed into the color scheme too. And then this one is the desert coyote. <laughs> this is the only one who wasn't a strict dog, but I found this paint by number of this desert scene that I sort of pulled pieces from that I just really liked. So I wanted to work in the, the coyote in some respect. And then this is the 4th of July <laughs> with the Shriners on parade. Uh, this is the October one. <laughs> so they were all thematic, uh, and I'm going to do a calendar of all 12 of them for next year. Uh, but yeah, they sort of like tied to the months that they came out in. And then there was this one around Christmas <laughs> with the kids ice skating under the bridge. And these are all like, yeah, most of this is painted. So, and a lot of the colors that are, are overlapped sort of to give you like I could go back, this one, it's like there's yellow over red to make the orange, and then you, I can kind of get away with the desert one had even more of that going on where it's yellow over blue for one of the greens, and then there's, an, uh, there's a separate green, and then there's like an orange over pur purple to make the darker parts. So this is like exploring more of the, the ways that you can get a lot of colors without having to print 12 colors. And then the last one in this series was this pictorial scene where there's me doing a plain air painting <laughs> and then my dog, Ralph, taking a dump in the road. <laughs> and the, so that ended uh, in January of this year. So then I wasn't gonna do a series, but then I, of course, ended up doing a series again. I think I just like having to build sort of a weird little body of work. And then it's kind of nice because you have this body of work to have a little show at the end of it. Like the 52 prints was really cool because it filled like an entire room with all those. And then we had a small show of the, the dogs in the spring. But then this year, what I started doing is uh, making prints of these little hot dog stands around Chicago. And a lot of them, I, I, I'm doing a split between ones that still exist and ones that are just gone that I could find photos of online and work from. But they're sort of just based on these weird little buildings. And I think, it's not totally specific to Chicago, but it sort of is a Chicago thing. Um, but these these funny little buildings that are just covered in signs. This is like the best example. It's not a great photograph of it, but the this place Byron's up on Irving Park um, is insane. It's covered in like six different types of signage, and the the building is like not even a third or not even a fifth the size of this room. But it's these weird little places. I just love the old signage. I think, I, for a minute, I sort of dabbled in sign painting, and I realized pretty quick that I don't like it because I'm not that good at it. Like, a lot of people were asking me to do my handwriting painted on businesses or different things like that, and it's, I just like to work small, so this is sort of my weird little tiny, like, homage to sign painting, because I get to remake these signs that some guy made in the 70s, or older than that. Murph's is one that's gone, uh, but that was up on Montrose, and they have these hilarious signs that clearly Vienna Beef was providing them with, because they all have, like, the next one has the same sign as this one. It's, it's just a painted a different color. That's Ducks down on Ashland. That one's still there, too. Um, that's the newest one I've done, but I'm going to do 12 of these over the course of the year. I've done four so far, or five? I don't even know. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right now. Uh, it's kind of a balance for me of uh, you know freelance work, work, doing illustrations for other people, and sort of keeping my own weird little projects going. And uh, sometimes you know it's a lot to balance, but I think there's something to be said about having your own projects going all the time. Like you, obviously some weeks there's no time for it, but you should always have something going in the background of what you're doing. 
And if that's something, especially if it's something that you want to end up doing full time, like if there's some little portion of what you do that you enjoy more than the majority of what you do, try and do that as much as you can in the background and sort of on your own time. And then, I mean, if I can, if I can pay my bills and eat food every day, drawing dogs, taking a shit, you guys can do it too. <laughs> I want, I want somebody to come up here and quit your job right now. <laughs> so that's pretty much it for my presentation. Um, thank you.